Hi there. I'm Eric Word Weaver Shervin, Gothi of the Ridgar folk here in East Texas, and I would like to welcome you to the Raven's Call. This is a show where I ramble on about different heathen related subjects, just kind of whatever strikes my fancy, sets my mind on fire at the time. Big UPG warning at the beginning of the episode, like always. Uh, this is a show where I, I share my views. This is just the views of one heathen in East Texas who, uh, who just happens to run a, a tribe here and uh, likes to talk, and people seem to enjoy listening. So, uh, <laughs> as long as you guys enjoy it, I will continue doing it, uh, provided that, you know, I can, given all the stuff that's been going on lately. But, I um, take everything that I say with a grain of salt. The whole idea behind this is just to, to spark interest, to get you thinking outside the box, maybe give some newbies some directions to look in. Uh, things like that. You know, I am not the end-all, be-all authority on anything. I am not the you're-doing-it-wrong guy. Um, I'm very middle of the road on my heathenry, um, an even mix between tradition and new uh, new thought and new growth. So that's just kind of how I roll, how I do things, you know. So that being said, um, all of my contact information is down below. You guys know the drill. If uh, you want to send anything into the channel, artwork, fan mail, anything like that that you want featured on the channel, the P.O. box is down there in the bottom. Um, otherwise, you know, email, uh, Facebook, all that's on there. I try to reply as much as frequently as I can. Um, comments down below, I at least try to give a heart uh, to let you guys know that I see it and it's awesome and I love it that you're doing that. I may not necessarily have the time to respond, uh, but I do at least try to interact a little bit. Hey, I got the mosquito. And so, and I, I run woefully behind on my emails, but I'm getting better at that. I am. Um, I'm trying to check them more frequently and be able to catch up on them. It's just I have to set aside dedicated time for that. And so I, I love doing it, though. It's a lot of fun. I love when you guys write in. It's awesome. So please feel free to do that. Um, I will say I'm not going to do your research for you. Uh, so people that email in and say, hey, can you give me a source on this? Hey, can you give me a source on that? I, I'm not necessarily going to take the time to go dig through my library and find that one obscure place where I happen to find a mention of this particular thing. It's ingrained in my memory, and it's been there for years. Uh, I may not even remember which book I went to as a source for it. I don't have my bibliography memorized. Um, so, I mean, I'll, I'll throw out options and suggestions and stuff when I can. Um, but, you know, bear with me. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I have to do my own research on stuff. I don't necessarily have the time to go through and do everybody else's research, too. But if I do know of some cool stuff, I will share it to you. Um, and I will uh, do some more featured stuff on some sources here coming up. Um, I'll go dig through my library and, uh, because I think things are starting to settle into something of a pattern for me. So hopefully that means I will have the opportunity and time to go through and rifle through my library a little bit and showcase a few things that I really, really, really like. So we'll see. I may do a library day where I'm just like, hey, this is cool, and this is cool, and yeah, we'll see. Plus, I have a whole lot of stuff that's digital that I can't just like hold up and show you. So um, that is what it is. I can tell you about some of it, but I'd almost have to sit here with my iPad and flip through and be like, uh, here's this source, and then hold the iPad up to the camera, and that would be doable. Maybe. We'll see. Okay. Anyway, onwards and upwards. Let's talk about today's subject. Now, <coughs> pardon me. Today, I want to talk about something very specific and important to me. And this ties in with some of the runic talk. This is going to be a ramble, okay, guys? Uh, just because this is something that was on my mind. And, you know, I did a video last week about the whole get out there and vote, be a doer, be, be someone that they write about. Um, and yes, yes, I know it was mostly about the vote thing, but I did go into traditions. I went into building hearth cult and tribal culture. And I'm still 100% behind all of that. Um, pardon the background noise. We're not that far off the road, unfortunately. But um, this is this kind of a... Con it's not really a continuation so much as it is an expansion on the ideals and just kind of what got my mind going. Because um, for those that don't know, that haven't followed like the after stuff in the, in the videos, I've recently experienced a shift, a catastrophic shift in uh, my employment. So the facility that I was working at, working in the field of childcare, specifically CPS kids, uh, closed down. 
and so it's not there anymore. And uh, because of that, I find myself between positions. And one of the things that I am doing with my time is I'm working with my father to help kind of breathe new life into the family business with the hope that maybe I can step in and uh, with my brothers and uh, my, the rest of my family, my mom and my dad, uh, step up and really turn that into something and hopefully turn it into something that will support all of us because um, they, they've been on some hard times like everybody else has through COVID-19 um, and there's been some extra stuff that they've had to deal with um, due to some ex-employee kind of you, you know how it goes it's just drama um, but the family business is good and solid and true so we've just got to kind of get it over this hump and back up and going and it got me to thinking today as I was sitting out there with my dad and I was helping him on some projects. Um, he runs a construction supply company. We sell all kinds of stuff. And uh, one of the things we do is he sells and services uh, these surveyor instruments, which if you're not familiar with what a surveyor instrument is, um, it's basically a telescope with a level on it, <laughs> essentially is what it is. Um, it's got... Yeah, your two axes that you can sit here and level this thing out on. Uh, you use the bubble level in the middle of it. And what it does is it creates a level sight line so you can look out over a distance and judge with a vertical measuring rod uh, the height or depth of a an area. Like if you're if you shoot the top of a hill, you can see that you know uh, you're at four foot. You know, that's what the crosshair is on the on the rod. You're at four foot. And if he goes out 20 feet and it's at six foot, then you know there's a two foot drop over that 20 foot period. And so it helps in surveying uh, plus a number of other uses. That's not the only use. That's just one of the simplest to explain. And uh, all growing up with my dad, I watched him work on these things, um, service them. He would sit there and tear them down, rebuild them. Um, I watched him one time rebuild the crosshairs of a uh, of one of these instruments it's got a little a literal crosshair in the middle uh, usually the off the production line ones have little wires in there that are hung up you have to be very careful not to breathe down the tube when you are <laughs> when you are putting these things together and taking them apart because they will snap uh, sudden temperature stuff will cause them to snap and they're horrible to try and replace well i watched my dad one time replace a crosshair with spider web <laughs> and it was incredible the man was a genius he is a genius when it comes to all of this stuff and he was incredibly gifted at anything that he touched his hands on i mean he was he's got an engineering mind like nobody's business and uh but he he'd always turned his attention to the family business because it was we didn't start the business but my grandfather bought it um way back in the 60s or 70s or something and then my dad took it over and uh, the goal is for us to take it over and this brings me to today's subject which is legacy um, as I'm sitting there with my dad working on this instrument and he's training me in this art of instrument repair that he had been doing for his whole life uh, and that I have watched him do my entire life and I've picked up a lot of tricks and everything he's trained me on it before um, this was just a different avenue of it than what I normally work on. And so as I'm sitting here going through cleaning lenses and everything uh, with this thing taken apart on the counter and we're sitting here talking and sharing stories and, uh, you know, talking to relatives on the phone and everything, I, it just struck me that this is what heathenry is all about. Heathenry is about family. Heathenry is about that legacy and that passing on of things, that that connection, that was living weird in the moment. That was that was Orlog feeding my weird in that exact moment and forming new Orlog as we progress from one moment to the next. I was putting good things in the well and spending time with my father and then my brother when he came out there and my other brother comes out there too um, and my mom when I get to spend time with her. But in this exact moment, it was special to me and I got to thinking because the last rune if you look at the progression of runes um, through the Elder Futh arc uh, it starts with Feu which is material wealth um, movable wealth especially uh, the Orox the Oxen the idea being that it is um, exchangeable material wealth frequently used in current society to mean money uh, material wealth in general these things and 
the last room is Otala. And Otala is that immaterial wealth, those things that cannot be easily exchanged. Um, there is a term uh, back over in Europe called Odal lands. It comes from Odal, O-D-A-L, um, or O-D-E-L, depending on region and uh, language and whatnot. Um, but it comes from that Otala root, that Odal, Otala, Odel, and the idea being that it was family land that was passed down. It wasn't movable wealth. It was the image. It was material, but it was permanent. There was a permanence to it. Now, the immaterial side of Otala extend, extends out to family. It extends out to um, kith and kin in general. Those things that are deeply permanently valuable to you and not necessarily uh, equatable to financial exchange you know yes you can you can put a price on land you can buy an acre for i think it's like ten thousand an acre out here in the area that i'm at um at least that's what i was appraised at back in the day um it may be more by now but um and it is definitely more the further into town you get uh, keep in mind i'm out in the sticks but while you can put a price on land you can't put a price on family land where memories are ingrained, where you have spent a significant amount of your time, where there are uh, memories and legends, family legends built around these places, you know? And that's something that in America specifically, we don't really have that term anymore. You don't look around and see, you know, Odal lands um, as a term or even referred to. Um, family land is a rarity these days. And a lot of that has to do with the, the transient nature of American society, of Western society, where we're shifting from location to location. Um, kids may grow up with their parents, go to school or trade school, learn a trade, whatever, and then they may end up halfway across the United States and only see their parents once or twice a year or not interact with their family at all. And this rugged individualism that seems to be the cornerstone of Western society is taken to such an extreme that it's toxic to family. And so, you know, everybody feels like they have to go out and make their life like the, the life has to be out there somewhere and that it can't be here. It's almost to the point that people look down upon people who choose not to leave their hometown. I've been given numerous opportunities over the years to seek employment or career opportunities uh, in other parts of Texas. It's still Texas, but it's not East Texas. It's not where my roots are. This is where my family is. This is where, you know, the bulk of my tribe is. This is, this is home. And there is, and <sighs> there is value to that that I can't place a number on. That's something that I wouldn't exchange for any amount in the world. And it's deeply, deeply important to me. Roots. If you guys have followed the channel, you know I equate heathenry to the tree with roots and tradition, the trunk and the now, and then the branches reaching out to the future. Um, I do a lot with relation to the imagery of tree and well. And this is where my well is. This is where my roots are set. The well here feeds my roots. And this is something that I would love to see for heathens of the future. I would love to see people be able to set down roots in such a way that generation after generation, they have the ability to pass on land and stability, to be able to provide for future generations something tangible and material so that that's something they don't have to worry about. You know, in the modern society, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about like millennials not being able to afford a home. Uh, not being able to buy property or a house um, because the market's just not there. Um, the industries just don't pay enough for them to be able to do it. Uh, the the you know, market's all messed up, so credit is impossible to attain, all this stuff. And in some areas, that's very, very true. In other areas, it's not as much. Um, it depends. It's a very regionalized thing in a lot of ways. Um, it also depends on the area of, you know, the industry that you go into, things like that. Um, 
Plus, there's a whole push in modern society for college, 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 instead of encouraging uh, trade schools. And this is a guy with a college degree who is getting out of a college degreed field and is looking at trade-oriented stuff. Um, I've, I've lived that. That has been my experience. And uh, so, you know, Western society is not built around multi-generational anything. Uh, American society, we throw away old stuff. We don't keep it. We don't pass it down. Heirlooms are something you hear about in history books or that are passed down from, you know, a relative that lived through World War II or before. You don't have a whole lot of heirlooms from uh, post-World War II era. You may see some Civil War stuff that's passed down. You may get some memorabilia from like Vietnam era. But again, most of these are marked by wartime and not even about, you know, just this is an item that your grandfather carried around forever uh, and he got it from his father and his father got it from his, etc., 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 or, you know, mothers and whatever. There's not a lot of that anymore. And I would love to see that come back. I would love to see people start to build these things. We're not going to see it magically come back in a generation. It's not going to happen. That's not the way this works. You know, I've talked before about the generational adoption of tradition. In order to ingrain tradition, it needs to be uh, upheld for three generations for it to actually work and for it to actually become somewhat permanent. And uh, you're not going to get, you know, family land all of a sudden in you know, a generation. You're not going to be able to shift everything within the American society so that people can get the permanence of land in a generation. I mean, it's, it's just not going to happen. Um, all of those problems, all those economic problems are there. Um, the focus is the, the zeitgeist of America, or North America in general, uh, pushing towards these industries that don't give you any sense of permanence. Um, hell, my industry... Uh, which is relatively recession-proof because there's always going to be CPS kids and they're always going to need care. Um, it wasn't state-proof. And so, you know, that's a whole thing I'm not going to get into. Um, but it, what should have been permanent and rooted for me dried up and went away. And now the only thing that I have left is my, my odal inheritance my the things that i have gained that are of you know more permanent wealth like my land and uh my my home and my family and hopefully the family business because the family business will become old old property it will be passed down from a generation to another um and it will be one of those things that my grandfather ran it my dad has run it, and if the next generation can step up and run it, that's a three-generation family business. You don't see a whole lot of those anymore, um, and those that you do are really cool. Uh, they've got a unique kind of culture to the business themselves, and people in the area tend to love them because they've always been there, and they have a lot of respect for them. I love family-owned and operated things, and I like to encourage those and, and support those as best I can, but we also live in an era of big box stores and Amazon, and let's be honest, a family mom-and-pop business is very difficult to run when people can just clicky-clicky and then order the same thing that you have on the shelf for $5 less and have it shipped to the house. It's difficult. So Western society is building more and more and more towards this, uh, this industrialized, technologically advanced industrialized society wherein everybody's working in, you know, packing boxes and, and working in shipping because, you know, they don't need mom and pop stores anymore. Um, so I would say go out and support your mom and pop stores when you can, if you can, um, because they're trying to do uh, the dream. They're trying to live the dream. And uh, not just the American dream, but the heathen dream of, of providing for one's family through blood, sweat, and tears, and, and doing right, and trying to create something you can pass down. Um, this, is, this is my dream. This is something that I would like to see. And again, this is a ramble, so there's not a whole lot of directed point <laughs> to this video other than to say uh, this is something that I see as intrinsic to heathenry, that I see as very important and lost in the modern era, um, particularly in the field of businesses, um, family land, and I just want to get people thinking about that. 
what does it mean to you? What, what is the value to you? Does it even matter to you as a heathen in the modern era? Because the heathen in the modern era looks very different than the heathen from 2,000 years ago. Uh, it just is. Um, that's the nature of progression. The heathen of a thousand years ago looked very different from the heathen a thousand years before that and a thousand years before that. If you go back into some of the Bronze Age stuff in Northern Europe, you're going to find a very different look to what we would refer to as heathenry than you would, say, in the Viking era. It's just progression of time leads to adaptation and alteration in worldview, in technique. Now, there's some key things that are always passed down in the way of, of like ritual and tradition that we want to see continued to pass down. And that's a large part why people are doing the research that they are to try and recreate some of these things from those eras so that we can have a piece of that now and maybe not have lost it to these darker times where there just wasn't a whole lot <laughs> that was recorded and kept. Uh, we're having to work with smidgens of information when we should have entire volumes. M not even volumes, just traditions passed down the way traditions should be passed down. You know, in the modern era, I encourage writing, very much so. Write things down. The reason I encourage that is so people in the future generations can go back and read it and see and not have to deal with this gap that we have now. The problem is, we shouldn't have to do that at all. We should still be able to pass things down from generation to generation. That's what we really want. Now, I'm, I'm still all about write stuff down because that will help things survive. Uh, that will help things pass on to future generations when they come back. Even if the next generation doesn't keep a particular tradition alive, uh, two generations from now they may be looking through the old books of your tribe and see that you know the first generation did things this way and be like, hey, I like that. Let's learn from that and let's go from there. Um, some things that may be lost to negligence and uh, distraction may be brought back to life in future generations. And think about what skills and trades you can pass down to future generations. And when I say future generations, I'm not just talking to those individuals that can have kids. I'm talking as you build tribe and you build culture. Um, expose your kids to everything. If you've got artisans, craftsmen, um, bards and poets, whatever, expose them to everything. And then encourage them to you know, apprentice under these people and learn their skills. Grow as a community bring breadth and strength to the tribe. I think that's a beautiful thing. An absolutely beautiful thing. And that's a that's an ongoing thing for me here is thinking about the continuation of trade, the continuation of of skill sets, things that you're not necessarily going to learn from a book. You know, I could go to school to learn about, you know, uh, these instruments that my dad and I repair, the, the whole uh, surveyor's instrument deal. I could go and learn about surveyor instrument repair from a school. Um, I could get training specifically from the vendors on how to repair their specific stuff and service it in-house and become a certified, you know, serviceman facility, etc., etc., etc. But none of those are going to teach the spiderweb trick. They're just not. That's something that my dad came up with on the fly and showed me and told me, and it has stuck with me for years. For years. There's little tricks, tricks of the trade, that he has picked up, that he has designed. Uh, like I said, he's brilliant with this stuff. To see the little things that he's developed over the years and to be able to pick those up and bring them into my own tool set and expand on them, to have my own ideas added to that, to build on that. You can't buy that. They don't, they don't teach that in a school. They can't. That's not where that exists. That exists in the real world. In the real world. We forget what the real world is. We forget and think that, you know, the online world is the real world. We think the political world is the real world. We think about big meta stuff as the real world. That's not the real world. That's not where it's at. The real world is where you are, around you. You're in Ingarth, your surrounding community, grassroots. That's the real world. The real world is where you go to work every day. 
The real world is sitting around the family table and sharing a meal. Or sitting in the living room yelling at football together. Or playing a D&D game around a table. That's the real world. That's where what matters is real. Not what everybody tells you is real. Like the political scape. Or, you know, what's going on on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News or BBC or whatever. No, that's not the real world. This is the real world. This is where what matters is, is there and is real. We fight to keep that outer world away so that we can protect this inner world, this, this real world. That's what that's about. That's, that, that's what my focus is on. How do I protect what's important to me? And uh, how do I hope to gain what I can from the previous generation while I can? So that maybe I can pass it down to someone going forward. Maybe I can, you know, teach a, nep- a nephew or a niece on down the line my dad's spiderweb trick. How cool would that be? To sit here, you know, 20 years from now. I got a little niece that trundles up there and is watching me repair an instrument in the same shop that my dad repaired them in. In the same shop that his dad repaired them in. And show her the spiderweb trick. That my dad taught me. How cool would that be? Some of you get to live this. Some of you already have this. And props. Keep it up. Mad respect. Do it. Teach it. Live it. I don't care what anybody else says. Own it. <laughs> Let the haters be the haters. Certifications, cool. Get your certifications if you need to. But that's, that's, that's the stuff that you get so the outer world accepts you as a mechanic or as a welder or whatever what makes you an amazing welder what makes you an amazing mechanic what makes you amazing at the repair of surveyor instruments are the tricks of the trade taught by people who had to figure it out the hard way they didn't have the special tool you know Um, they didn't have the luxury of waiting to order a new crosshair which was more expensive and ridiculously fragile when he could fix it right there and then with a spider web. Spider web. Just too cool. So anyway, anyway, I'm going to go ahead and cut this one here today. But this is what I want you guys thinking about going forward. What are the traditions you're passing forward? What are the traditions that are available to you now that you might be missing out on? That you might not get to see in another 10 years? What can you snatch up before it's gone? What matters to you? Only you can decide that. I think in this transition that I'm going through these days, I have discovered a lot more about what matters to me. I thought I got it before. But every day, I think I get it a little bit more than I did before. And if you can't look back 10 years ago at yourself then and compare yourself to where you are now and say, man, that kid was an idiot, you're probably not growing. (laughs) Not to say everybody was an idiot when you were younger, but to see growth. You should see growth. You should be able to look back and say, man, I was doing that wrong. Or, man, I'm so much better at that than I was back then. It's a thing. It's a thing. So, with that, we're going to end today. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed your winter nights. Uh, It was a beautiful night out. Um, Just gorgeous, gorgeous full moon. I got to spend it around a fire and uh, drinking some meat, and it was amazing. Loved it. Um, So I hope you guys are having a fantastic uh, season as we enter into the dark season of the year. I wish you all luck. I wish you all well-being. I hope that uh, as we come into the Yule season that you are able to really connect with those things that matter. This is a time of year where I get uh, really insightful. Uh, I turn in in my thinking a lot, um, introspective in a lot of ways. And so I really hope that uh, you guys see some, some cool stuff from the season yourselves. So thank you all for watching. Thank you all for supporting the channel. Uh, it means more to me than I think a lot of you realize. Uh, it's been very supportive of me through all of this and given me something that I can focus on and feel like I'm actually doing something for. And so I'll get into some more ed- educational stuff here coming up soon. Some more talks on some things. I'm going to come back on the whole Wild Hunt conversation and the Frith Weaver conversation in some future videos. Keep sending in requests. I do look at those and I use them to build my uh, build my videos. Um, this was just a tangent, a ramble that hit me today. 
uh, from a very poignant point in my life. So I hope, uh, I hope it was at least entertaining to listen to. And uh, those that needed to hear it, I hope it, it got you thinking about what really matters in life. Those that already knew, props to you. Never lose sight of it. Never lose sight. Hail to you all, thank you. May your hearth fires burn bright. Okay, so, fun. Uh, updates. Um, let me see, updates. Uh, updates are pretty pretty sparse. I mean, we're doing... There's a lot of things I can't talk about necessarily uh, because they're behind-the-scenes stuff with my dad's business. But needless to say... It's a it's a, it's a slog, but we're we're making some headway. I think some good things. So fingers are crossed. I'm very excited about what could come from there. Um, it's actually part of what gave me the idea for today's video, uh, which will make sense to you by now because you will have seen the video wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff. And so yeah, good stuff there. Lots of fun. Um, plus I'm just loving getting to spend time with my dad because it's awesome and he's my dad and he's amazing. So you know. I'm one of those guys that was very lucky to have two very awesome parents, and I love them both dearly, So, and I don't mind saying so on the channel. So anyway, um, as far as like the D&D &D update, there isn't really an update yet. We're still waiting to have our next session because of, you know, just stuff. Um, mostly my wife's work schedule and then other obligations that we have. Uh, adult D&D, &D, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a thing. I said it last time. I say it every time. Um, you may go a month between sessions, but that's okay. I'll just give them some extra shiny stuff or, you know, level them up or something. I don't know. Some kind of, uh, you know, thank you for being so patient with me. Uh, but, you know, it's a long haul thing. It's not a short haul thing. This is a long haul, long ongoing type game. Um, I've got campaign stuff ready for years. So hopefully um, once we can, you know, get through some humps here. Uh, it will be easier for us to get together. At least that's my finger. My, my fingers are crossed for that. My hope, my dream. Uh, I love D&D. &D. <laughs> if I could get paid to be a DM, um, that would be my life. I would do that all the time. I'd just hire out, be a DM for everybody, uh, and charge per session, and be like, hey, let's go. Let's do it. I will make you guys gods, and you will have a blast doing it, or you will die in the process. One of the two, uh, but I'm not going to try and kill you. I'm going to let you have as much fun as humanly possible. Um, yeah, that's just my DM style. I'm very story-oriented story and whatnot. So I like for my characters to feel like badasses. That's my goal. That's what I want them to be in the end. I want them to be badasses, but I also want them to feel like they've earned it. And so, yeah, much fun, much fun. Love D&D. I uh, love role-playing in general. I've got tons of systems. It's not, D&D is not the only thing that I'm into. It's just that D&D is the most recent one. And I, I almost feel obligated at this point to do these little updates after the, uh, after the cutting room, in the cutting room floor, my little monologue, as I call it. I feel like, uh, you know, like Jay Leno or one of the night show guys doing a monologue before the show actually starts, only it's after the show starts because I put all the business stuff up front. And um, so, I don't know, I have fun with it, but uh, I almost always get comments on it, so that's cool. Um, I had to shoot this part twice um, because I made a flub, and so I may repeat myself on a few things, thinking that I said it in the last cut, only I said it in this cut, and eh, see, wibbly wobbly timing, why me? Nye. But anyway, I'm filming this on Tuesday, so wish me luck. Hopefully I have it up on the channel by morning. You already know by now, so either congratulate me or not. You know, simple as that. All right, without any further ado, I think we're going to jump into today's subject. So we'll see. Fingers crossed, hopefully. All right, so we're live in three, two, one. Let's jump. You know, I think that went re really well. Um, I don't understand how sometimes... I can go from not really knowing what I was going to do this morning. Like, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to film. I don't understand. What am I going to film? Holy crap. I'm not going to have anything to go up tomorrow. What am I going to do? To sitting there and just having that moment of inspiration with my dad and being like, wow, this turned out to be something that I really enjoyed. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. But it really hit home for me. I think I needed that. So hopefully you guys did too. We'll see. I don't know. Anyway, back to editing. This is how we edit videos. This is how we edit it. This is how we edit shit. Edit shit. Edit shit. This is how we edit shit on the iPad. Wah. 
Yes, I know I'm being crazy. I don't care. You guys don't get to see the edit part very much. So plus smoke. Uh, this is the Nika Rustica uh, Bellicoso. I like them. They're very nice. I very much enjoy these. So, but yes, we film down there. Then we sit up here. We offload everything onto the iPad. And we start working. Used to be that I would edit on my actual phone. And when I'm done, if I'm going to add this to the video, then I got to move it from there to here, which is simple. I just hit airdrop. Ah, cool. Uh, it has really changed the game when it comes to editing, and I really enjoy it. So, ha, fun, little behind-the-scenes stuff. So, oh, I keep forgetting to look at the camera. It's the thing about filming on your iPhone. You want to look at the picture, but you can't. You got to look at the camera. I do it all the time in my videos. I'm sitting here looking at my, my, my picture because I'm, like, trying to make sure I'm in a frame. Everything's good. Everything's all great and everything. And then, um... Not so much, you know? I'm sitting here looking at the wrong thing, and then it looks like I'm just staring off into space instead of looking at the camera and looking at you guys. But then I don't feel, if I'm looking at the camera, like I'm really doing anything. It feels kind of silly. But it is what it is. Uh, that's life on camera. You kind of get used to it after a while. And then I almost grabbed the wrong sound effect. Let me, guys, guys, let me know if the sound effects are too stupid. Um, like right now I'm adding the whole comedy horns thing for the, uh, cutting room floor. And I like to drop those down a little bit so that it's not, uh, not as loud. It doesn't blow anybody's eardrums out when they hit the video. Um, but I don't know if y'all actually like that. So, um, if you do not, let me know. And I will shift it. I hope you can hear me okay. I don't have the mic on anymore. And my headset's hooked up to the iPad. So I don't necessarily... Placement right there. I can't necessarily hear you. Or I don't necessarily know if you can hear me. Thinking. So, anyway. I'm going to get off this so I can focus on this. But I was just giving you a little behind-the-scenes sneak peek of what it's like building a video for you guys. Because it's fun. And uh, y'all seem to like some of the behind-the-scenes sneak peek stuff. So, um, you know, maybe one of these days I'll do a live stream while I'm editing so you guys can see my process or something. It's kind of boring, but I don't know. Some of you may find it interesting. There's a lot more that I can do that I just haven't figured out yet because I haven't had the iPad that long. Um, but as I figure it out, I may play with some of my other elements. There we go. It wasn't responding. Um, add some stuff. Cool things. I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, going to sign off. Later, guys. Thank you.